Thank you to everyone who stayed until the end. Uh, I heard people sobbing. Good for you, I did too, and I'm not ashamed to say it. Um, I would like to start, because this film is about a victory, I would like to start by stating some other victories that this film had. Um, and I'm only going to mention uh, the awards it got in film festivals because the nominations were, were much um, more numerous and I don't think we would have time for that. Um, so it got the directing award at Sundance in 2014, uh, the festival award, uh, award at Vail Film Festival in 2014, um, the audience award at South by Southwest in 2014, um, the Audience Choice and Jury Prize at River Run in 2014, and the Gay and Lesbian Entertainment Critics Association um, Dorian Award in 2015. Um, for those of you who know a bit about film festivals, these are all huge, huge film festivals. So, um, and I think we all understand at this point um, why this film is so, so highly acclaimed. Um, a bit about Enrique since we're at Victories. Um, uh, Enrique just got the Hispanic National uh, Bar Association Top Lawyer Under 50, uh, Under 40 Award. For some reason, 40 is a is a huge age for that. Uh, so congratulations on that. And he was selected as one of the um, readers of 50 Fast Track Lawyers. Um, so uh, we're very happy to have you with us today. Um, Congratulations on being in the film, on being part of this project. I would have two short questions, and then I would like to turn it to the audience. So um, we were talking earlier in, in the week about how uh, you are the only uh, gay lawyer in, in the team. So um, I, I want to know, clearly like there's more at stake for you for being in this case. So uh, my first question is, what was the hardest thing in this case for you? to handle and to manage. Thank you so much for having us here, by the way. Fantastic um, film festival, Alex. Um, hope this is on. Uh, I think that like the most difficult part about it being gay, because there's just two parts. One, it's like you have the, the weight of, of the movement and what it means, right? So when we filed this case, we thought this case was a perfect vehicle because Proposition 8 was so unique, right? The California Supreme Court had given the right to marry to same-sex couples, and Proposition 8 was engineered to take it away. And because it was engineered that way, we had three different ways that we could actually win on the merits, right? We could argue that there was, there's a fundamental right to marry that all Americans get. This law takes it away. We could argue that, that as Americans, we are all entitled to equal protection under the laws, and that this law treats gays and lesbians differently. Second way to win. And the third way to win, which was unique to the proposition, was that because um, there was a case that was decided uh, by the Supreme Court in the 90s called Roe v. Evans, and there a Colorado initiative had been passed, which basically stripped uh, the ability of gays and lesbians to uh, petition the legislature. And the court struck down that, that law, saying that any law that's designed specifically to um, harm gays and lesbians was unconstitutional. We thought, wow, we have these three different ways of doing it. This seems like a perfect vehicle. But the gay and lesbian community who had been you know, working on this case, as you saw in the film, for, very, for many years was against this. Um, and they thought it was too fast, too soon, that we should be in the States for another, another 30 years in all reality. Um, and what made it difficult was that you know, I believed strongly in the, mis in, the, in the vision that Ted and, and David had. And I believed that the law was right. But all my friends you know, were of the movement. You know, and having dinner parties and explaining to them this was actually the right thing to do and the time was now. It, made it, it was a very uncomfortable time until we started winning that everybody was like, oh yeah, of course we're going to win. So. Um, in terms of you as a lawyer being in this film, I know there are a lot of confidentiality issues with lawyers, which is why we discussed again earlier in the week that uh, we don't usually see lawyers in, um, in documentaries. Um, so how did you navigate that? Uh, what were the issues? How did you deal with them? That's a great, lawyer, uh, great question to ask a lawyer. So the, we have attorney-client privilege, which, you know, as you may know, protects your communications with clients. And the way that privilege is protected is that it has to be confidential. You have to keep it you know, cl close to the vest. And so the idea of having a film <laughs> kind of like defeats that, right? Um, 
And it was a hard decision to make. I mean, but it really, at the end of the day, it wasn't our decision because as lawyers, we don't control the privilege. It's really the plaintiffs who have a decision whether or not they want to release it. Um, and it was the choice they made. And the reason they made that choice is because they realized that this case wasn't going to be lost or won only in the courts, that the public was part of this. The, the education campaign that we were doing with the case was an equal part of this, of this case. And they wanted their story told because they're hoping that people see this movie and you know, people who maybe haven't thought of the issue or against the issue become empathetic and realize this is a human issue um, and that we should all support this. This is not Democrat, Republican. This is just a human issue. Um, uh, so it was really their decision. And, but the thing about it, even though they decided we're like, okay, we're going to waive this and we're not going to do that, it still was weird as a lawyer to know that there's people in the room that you're not supposed to have in the room. And um, it, it took a little while to get used to. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Yes. Um, we have a microphone, so please wait until it gets to you. Thanks. Did you ever think about having the children uh, be the plaintiffs in the case in addition to, or maybe even instead of, their parents because of the sympathy factor that came from Justice Kennedy and other people. I, I had always thought that when this case was won, it would be won with children as plaintiffs because however biased and discriminatory you are, it's a lot harder to do that for most people to children. So I, I was it was just curious if there was ever any consideration of having the children be the plaintiffs instead or in addition to. I think that's really interesting because at the end of the day at, at the Supreme Court and today, now, children is really the focus of these lawsuits in, in many ways. A child can't be a plaintiff in this particular case because th although they are being harmed, they're not the one who's actually being constitutionally harmed. That, that would be the, the person who wants to get married. But even the idea of having a child testify, which I think is fascinating, we, we were totally scared of that. We didn't, want, we didn't even want the plaintiffs to testify, right? We thought we were going to go not even have a trial, that we were going to go right to the appellate court. So then getting into, get into the idea like, wow, our plaintiffs are actually going to testify and we've got to get them ready. We, we did everything in our power to keep the child, the children out of it. That was our strategy then. But now after you know, seeing how Kennedy feels and like basically how, how the court feels about the children, I think that if we did the case over again, I, I, I think I agree with you 100%. I think we would have a child testify about the harm that's inflicted because that harm is, is um, in many ways, if you're not gay and lesbian, that's maybe the harm that you could, that you could identify the fastest, the quickest. You know, you all have a child and everybody, every child thinks their parents are weird and different. Um, and so they could, you know, they could attach to that and be like, yeah, that, I wouldn't want to be discriminated because of what, of what my parents are like, who they are. Here comes the microphone, right, right down. I think this is our last gentleman in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, brilliant performance, by the way. Um, I have two questions, and they're easy questions. My first question is, you had mentioned during the film that this was your first trial. Have you been a part of many more trials since then? I've been a part of a lot of trials, actually, since then. And I have a big trial right now, an education trial in California. Congratulations. Um, are you a California citizen? Resident, yes. Resident. Um, have you been married since this decision? We got married before that decision, so we got in that window ah, right, okay. between the marriages and Prop 8. Well, congratulations on Thank both you. of those. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm not sure how many more questions we have time for, so maybe have Bernardo and then that wrap it up. <laughs> Just one quick question. So, for you know, I've always wondered what it's what it's like to be a participant in a documentary. And I'm just wondering if you can talk about. You talked a little bit about you know it, it being um, unusual or uncomfortable. You know, in in uh, in those moments when when you're strategizing. Uh, but I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about the relationship between you and the filmmakers and the other attorneys and the filmmakers, uh, because there's clearly such an extraordinary kind of intimacy and access there and an attentiveness on the part of the filmmaker. So I'm just wondering if you could describe that relationship for us. It's fascinating. Actually, it's a relationship that developed, right? So they filmed us for five years. It's two gentlemen, uh, Ben and Ryan, Ben Cotton and Ryan White. 
Um, and in the beginning, it's like strangers. So you, you're very, you know, reserved, um, and you are, you you have talking points that you want to get through. Um, and, uh, and it was very interesting. I mean, as a lawyer, you know, I'm always advocating. So I'm thinking you're asking me a question, like, what's the best answer for my client to like answer that? Um, but after a while, like they, they became friends and Ben and Ryan are both gay and they're both like really interested in, and, uh, have a personal stake in what happened in this case. Um, and so the relationship, you know, you know, you get to a point where like the camera's in front of you, but you're like, you know, you're looking beyond the camera and you're, you're just having a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the directors that they're filming you. Um, and I think it felt, it was, it was that way for everybody. And the person who had the most resistance to filming was Ted Olson. I mean, he thought this was ridiculous. Like, this is crazy. Like, we're going to win the case. He believed in the PR, but he, he doesn't need to be on TV. So he had no vanity. He didn't want to do it. But at the end of the day, like, you know, he got in, they, the cameras got in there because he felt comfortable with them and he trusted them. Um, and he is like now one of the biggest proponents of the film. He's like, oh, I should have let you in more, you know, because this, this, you guys did such a good job, you know. Okay, thank you to everyone for coming. Um, we have two more films today, Slums, The Cities of Tomorrow with Nicola as a guest and then Reportero with Bernardo, who is our director. Uh, please come to both of them. One of them starts at 5.30, the other one starts at 8. Then we have an after party at the back door with uh, uh, April Carion uh, performing. She was here as a guest for Mala Mala, so everyone's invited. Please join us. And um, that will also be an opportunity to talk to the guests uh, more since we hope everyone will be there. Thank you.